we were given quite limited time. This session was only allocated an hour. And now we are left with uh, 15 minutes according to my watch. So we will now open the, uh, the floor to questions, uh, experiences that we may want to share on how we can encourage each other to achieve or to explore our different businesses that we want to or to excel in the areas that we are in. So we are now opening the floor to questions and comments. I understand there's an honorable minister from, from Namibia. May I give the floor to her? Yes. Uh, thank you very much, moderator. I will try to be fast. Lord, this is uh, one of my favorite topics. Uh, having served as a minister of women affairs and child welfare in my country, and the African know that uh, you had at one point give me such a task to be the African chief negotiator for the Beijing platform. Uh, uh, moderator, I think as uh, women, particularly African women, we can celebrate our achievements in the sense that uh, when it comes to the laws, we have already made a good success uh, to the extent that in most, if not all, African countries, we have now managed to adapt women-friendly laws uh, which cannot really prevent us to move forward. Uh, I know in my country it was a challenge when we got independence. And briefly to tell you my own experience, I got a job before my, minister, my, my, my husband. And then I wanted to register my husband into my medical aid. When I applied and I got a letter to say, you are not a breadwinner, so therefore your husband and your children cannot be in your medical aid, it's only yourself. So I took a pen and I wrote a five-page letter to the Minister of Finance, and I started defining the word uh, breadwinner, which I got from the dictionary, which says is a person who's working, earning a salary to sustain the family. And I was the only one working getting a salary and I was sustaining the family. So it became a cabinet discussion and later a decision was taken, no women can have, married women can have their husband the medical aid. And this is what it went to the extent that the laws are now friendly. What is remaining now is really a mind change. That is the biggest problem. Uh, the story our governor has started with of one being kept busy because of looking after the children. If the managers, they know that and appreciate it, they cannot just disqualify a woman from being promoted because she came with a paper which is not clean because the child is cramped on that paper. But because they don't have that understanding, that's why they behave like that. The same applies to ourselves as women. It's true, it's a myth, but sometimes you can see it being put in brackets. It's also because we are not changing our mind so that we can be focused. So I'm really seeing that there's a good progress that women are getting there. In the terms of the tourism industry, the whole issue is ownership. If you are not a board member, you know in the private sector, it's not like in the public sector, whereby board members of state-owned enterprises, they are appointed by the government. But in the private sector, you must have a certain shares, and then you are a board member. So if you are not getting shares, you will not become a board member, and you will not be in the management. So we have a way to find a way of getting there. And then now for us being in the small business, it's us to make them grow. You see, it's a question of bread and butter. And it's a question of power. Power cannot be given out easily. We men who are holding that power, they cannot just give it. So you have to fight for it in a very positive way. So that is really, we need to be focused, we need to be determined, and an example given there is the way really the right way. Finally, I appreciate the moderator's opening remarks. 
we should not put ourselves in the circle of consent. We should put ourselves in the circle of influence, and we can really make it. Let us talk less and do more, and definitely we'll make a difference in our own lives. So my question now is for our colleagues from Europe, from America. Now, we are talking about the African statistics. What is the statistics of women in the tourism industry in America? Because we in Africa, we are suffering twice. You are a woman, you have been one time colonized. And even men are fighting with whites. Because in Namibia, for example, tourism is known to be a white-dominated industry. And we are still in the process for blacks, both men and women, to get in. But you have passed the dead hundred years of your independence. Where are the women in this industry in America? Are they better than us in Africa? Or we are in the same position, or you are worse? And then we can learn our strategies. The minister, the honorable minister, would like to know where are the women in America in as far as tourism is concerned, their percentage, their participation in tourism. Are they a proud men? Are they, what are the ratios like? That's really what the minister wants to know. Thank you for the question. Uh, in my, my experience, I've had two businesses. I do not, I did not uh, seek funding. But um, in, in both cases, I was a single woman, divorced and single, and I did not experience um, a prejudice against me as a woman business owner. I started with nothing as far as uh, funding, but I built it up, um, both businesses, one was a hotel reservation service I had for 10 years in a com community, and um, another is now my marketing and sales uh, business. So in both cases, I didn't have any um, capital investment to start. I didn't seek it because as a service industry, it is hard to get financial support. But starting with nothing and building and building on hard work and, and effort, as it, it, all women do, um, it, I built it up and it's successful. So I didn't encounter the uh, anti-woman um, experience. It, it, Honestly, in business in America, the women are very much leaders uh, in the hospitality industry, particularly. They rise uh, to the top. Some of the very top uh, travel agencies are owned by women in America. The Valerie Wilson Travel just celebrated her 50 years of being, in, or 35 years, sorry. She'll have it in my head for that remark. Uh, she, 35 years as a woman, a business entrepreneur who started her own travel agency and expanded and expanded to be one of the top revenue producing agencies in the world. Um, and many, many women have success stories as travel agents and as owners of travel agency. So, um, and in, in the household, I can't really say that I've been successful. I'm uh, unfortunately divorced twice. <laughs> um, but um, uh, it's not because of a male dominant uh, attitude or the opportunity that, uh, that we have to take a second place. Uh, so I think the opportunities are much better in America for women. Uh, we're, we're considered leaders and uh, our opinions are respected very much in the hospitality industry. Are there any cultural barriers to entry for women to participate in uh, tourism in Zimbabwe? If so, are there any programs in place to advance women participation in tourism? That is question number one. Number two, how can we help you help yourself? Let me give you Thank you. Thank you for that very important question. There are no cultural barriers 
especially now that we have, uh, as parliament, we have enacted a bill to ensure 50-50% of participation of men and women in all sectors. Okay, and also, uh, our problem really has been, as I said earlier on, access to capital, support for those women who can make it, and also ensuring that those other women who think maybe the tourism sector is for those very educated ones, by educating them to come up forward. You participated yesterday in the ecotourism uh, pro program where we visited PC village. You don't need to be a rocket scientist to come up with such a program, but it would, it would be assisted by anybody who is willing to do so by funding, you know, um, orientation programs, for instance, and also ensuring that uh, we run uh, uh, seminars uh, similar to this and take them out there to the villages so that every woman can identify their potential. I know ZTA in the past came up with a program to try and uh, you know, encourage women to participate, but you know, there was a challenge with the capitalization and the women, you know, by our, you know, most of our background, most of us are, are very poor and uh, when women went to their program at ZTA, they thought maybe they'll get instant funding. But this was to assist them to identify their potential. When they realized there was no ready cash, some of them dropped off and that program did not succeed the way the ministry had uh, you know, viewed it to succeed. I don't know if I've answered your question. Thank you. Thank you. I'm being advised that we are left with five minutes, so probably we will take two or three more questions. My name is Rosalind McClelland. I'm with the media, uh, the network journal in New York. I'd just like to address Honorable Minister from Namibia about the women's situation in terms of entrepreneurship. Very quickly, uh, there is an organization called the National Association of Women Owned Businesses, and in their numbers, women still earn 77% of every dollar that a man earns. And in terms of access to finance, it is still more difficult for women. Many women, and then there's the disparity between white women and women of color. With women of color, they tend to use credit cards. They have a great, a harder time accessing capital through the banks. And so many of them use family, friends, uh, credit cards are a very popular way of, of starting businesses and also personal savings. And then the rate of failure as, we, as, as, as those businesses uh, take off, the rate of failure seems harder among, uh, greater rather, among women of color in the United States. And uh, there's one more thing, the fastest growing women are starting businesses in America at a faster rate than men overall. And within that, Women of color are starting businesses even faster than the general rate for women. So there is that this, there is discrimination in the banking and access to capital, as it is universally, it seems. And there is
um, identify where the funding or when the funding will be announced. Thank you. I wish I had better news because the funding will be limited. We have applied to the European Union, uh, who does occasionally provide us with funds for the promotion of tourism. And we believe we have a very strong case in, uh, in encouraging uh, women to not only participate in the tourism industry, but also to empower them to, to rise to higher uh, uh, levels. So the money will only be sufficient if it is agreed on, which we are positive, uh, to have four, uh, two, two countries in Latin America and two countries in Africa. But this is, of course, uh, an, an, an initiative that, that can be taken further. I, I want to say, very short, uh, Chairperson, women has made progress. 10, 20 years ago, there wouldn't have been a meeting where uh, empowering women would have been discussed. The message is up. We, we're not making enough progress. What we need is creating awareness. Talk to people. Let the newspapers write about it. Raise the level for the, of the subject. And then we need people who are change agents. Uh, individuals can mobilize quite a number of people. This can happen in many cases. So it's also in our own hands. Don't just sit back and wait for the government, etc. A question of, of financing from the banks and, and, and approach the government, approach the banks. Let us really get this issue on a higher level and I'm sure progress will come much sooner. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, the presenters. I was really touched by um, the lady there from uh, Malinda, Kemba Malinda. I think well done. Uh, it just shows that women can do it. But uh, the challenge is that women have, uh, in terms of balancing the act, is it uh, to have to run a family at the same time as you are starting uh, your own business or even to be a career woman for that matter. Uh, what we find, I'm a member of the Zimbabwe Leadership Forum, and we do have a lot of statistics on what is going on. We found recently that um, there were maybe three women, if not less than three women in Zimbabwe, who are leading uh, companies that are on the stock exchange. And that is pathetic. But the number of women with degrees and whatever, there's plenty of them. So there, there is generally a tendency for women to shy away from those jobs because of frustrations. Uh, because of lack of a conducive uh, environment like uh, the governor said. <coughs> so what we need at the moment, I think, is in the tourism industry, where a lot of people think that you need a lot of capital, startup capital. And yet we find that when it's consortium uh, uh, by men, for example, the hotel that we are in right now is owned by black men, and it's a consortium of men. But when, it's, when it comes to women, there's no support at all for a group of women. Uh, you know, to, to start up something as big as this. So I think there's generally lack of belief in what women can do and achieve. So what I would like to say is that we do need quotas in Zimbabwe, Madam Governor. Uh, no way has done it, and I know even the states did it, and uh, I think very few have attained the 50-50. For us in Zimbabwe, we have not even got to the state where we have attained 80% quotas for women. Unless that is uh, really uh, you know, pushed in, nothing will happen. You find yourself lonely in the boardroom. Uh, if you happen to have uh, a friend like I do, I do too, uh, you are very lucky. In most cases, you are just the only woman as a uh, dresser in that room, and you wonder when the other women are going to come. So there is a lot of work to be done uh, to push those women. Nothing will happen unless we do something about it. One man was uh, you know, actually professed uh, ignorance about this quota, and he said, look, um, I didn't realize I didn't have women on my board. <laughs> Until someone said, I'm not shy. There's not a single woman on your board. What is the problem? <coughs> then he started looking around to say, oh, where can I find a woman? Oh. <laughs> exactly, that is what is going on. So we just have to work on it. And then in terms of the lower levels where people can, uh, ordinary women can enter, I think we need to create clusters like India has done. You create clusters for women to work in communities where they can have a uh, you know, small place to leave their children in the morning or to work somewhere where there's a, a dropping center where they are, where they can see their children. Because that is the biggest influence for women. If they are still childbearing until they are 45 or 50, it's very difficult to rise up that ladder. 
Thank you. Thank you. I, I recognize the, um, the time is very short and we're um, a little bit off time, but there's been several of our uh, delegates that have come to me to ask this question, and um, I've been actually um, conflicted on how to answer it. This had to do with, um, with our visit yesterday to the wonderful uh, community village and, uh, and the wonderful experience we had yesterday. And I think I'm asking this question from a tourism industry perspective. I'm asking this so that way we as an industry, uh, as, as the international uh, uh, delegates coming in, the travel agents, the tour operators, uh, can help our, uh, our customers um, respect local culture, can help to uh, bridge the divide, can help become more peaceful visitors, uh, but also while uh, maintaining traditional uh, and, and, and respecting traditional and, and local tradition. Um, yesterday when we had the wonderful experience uh, of, of visiting the, the traditional and having a traditional meal, uh, many of the international delegates came up to me, in particular the men, uh, expressing concern because they felt uncomfortable uh, sitting on chairs while the women were, uh, in fact, sitting on the floor. Uh, my, my response was that, uh, you know, this is how it is done here, and this is an experience, and this is the tradition, and we as a tourism industry must respect the tradition. But I know that many felt uncomfortable, and the question is, as an industry, we don't want to destroy uh, local tradition. We don't want to come in and, 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 and and, and change the very product and the very, uh, the very, uh, the very culture that exists. However, uh, what happens in a situation like that, and what is the right thing to do? Uh, and um, you know, and, and I ask this question in all respect, but I know this was a topic that was on many, many, many of our delegates' minds. And uh, and how, as an industry, and perhaps the the UNWTO, perhaps in your research, you've done uh, uh, studies on this, or perhaps there's there, there, I'm, 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 this is not only limited to uh, to, to to our experience yesterday, perhaps this, this is also when visitors even come from perhaps Africa to the States and they see things we do in the US and may not be comfortable things we do in the US and engage or do they not engage or do they try to share their own values? So this is a more of a tourism question. I, I think the Honorable Minister is more capable of coming from the yes. cultural environment in which you speak. Of course we are very sensitive about culture. Culture is not cast in cement, and although we retain culture, there's also a demand, a change that has to take place. But uh, one must be very careful when you when you uh, touch on culture. And I'm sure, Minister, you would be able to deal with that. Uh, and now you are changing roles. <laughs> the governor. <laughs> Thank you, King Edward, about that. I thought as a king, you enjoyed that. <laughs> But in, in Zimbabwe, we attach a lot of importance to our culture. In fact, we revere our culture. And if a chief is around, you have to adhere. Okay? Because for tranquility, you had the chief repeating to tranquility. For peace and tranquility, you respect the elders. And that's the value we've imparted to our children. That's the values our parents imparted to us. But I can assure you, when I, you get into my office, yeah. I take the highest chair, yeah. the most comfortable. <laughs> Even when the chief comes, <laughs> if, if when the chief comes to my office for you know whatever, he will take the other chair. I will be in the high chair because we will be in an office setup. But when I go home to the village, yeah. I have to shift roles. As an African woman, proudly Zimbabwean, I enjoy, uh, you know, That's recognizing sweet. the yes. cultures of sweet the sweet woman. You do the same one, <laughs> not that you will always be sitting on mats and so on and so on. But that was, uh, you know, uh, a test of Zimbabwean culture. Thank you. That's a perfect picture. Just amazing. But that's our culture. And for, to every me meeting, a, a man will carry a small stool with him, so, and the woman will carry her man. Or that, you know, remember when we got to the Boma the after the night for the African experience, everybody got a cloth. And the, the, the purpose of that cloth is that when you get to that situation, even if you are wearing a three-piece suit, you just, uh, you know, 
try to you know, offer your, 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 your suit and uh, respect your chief. You don't have to do it uh, for four hours like yesterday, but you can do it as a catcher and then stand up and proceed with your business. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. We wanted to take more questions and more comments. Unfortunately, um, we have just been told we can't proceed anymore. So maybe I would advise that after the session, we can continue networking outside the session. And for the Zimbabwe, we are, we are going to create a Facebook 